glad you've joined us for this Good Friday service, whether it's online, you're watching on delay, or right here in the auditorium. It is a joy and delight as we gather in the name of Jesus to remember his suffering, his crucifixion, not the end of the story, but the, um, the beginning of something incredibly powerful that culminates in our celebrations on Sunday. The theme that we've chosen across this period for a series of sermons and messages ending with uh, Anzac, which is not too far away, is we will remember. And this morning I want to talk about clearly, we will remember the cross of Christ. We, we live in a society that is in love with itself. As human beings, by nature, we are incredibly self-absorbed. And I'm not trying to be overcritical, but I think in our modern day society, that has gone to a whole new level. And yet it hasn't made us any happier. It hasn't made us feel more fulfilled about who we are or what we're doing. And fundamentally, I believe the reason is, is we are not created for ourselves. We are created by God, for God, and to give Him glory. And when we live in that space, we find our greatest joy, our greatest peace, our greatest fulfillment. And that doesn't mean it won't be without struggle. Our theme for the year is one that I keep coming back to in my own thinking and even for my own life, the declaration out of the prophet Joel, where God says, I will restore you. He repeats it over and over again. I will restore you. One of the things that uh, we watch occasionally as a family is Fixer Upper. And it's always amazing as they take this derelict old house and restore it to something greater and better than it was even at the beginning of it being built. And I think that's what God is seeking to do in our lives, not just fix stuff, but restore us to something more magnificent, more powerful, more significant, that will bring glory to His name. And divine restoration is only found in and through the person of Jesus Christ. And somebody has to pay the price for restoration. It doesn't just happen. And the cross and all that led up to it is God's payment for your restoration, for my restoration. And when Jesus begins to work in our lives, we become fully human, fully alive, restored to Him in relationship and begin to understand who we are as those created in his image and for his purpose. The Apostle Paul, speaking to the church at Corinth, who considered themselves quite intellectual, modern in their day and era, he says, when I came among you, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he's raising this almost as a counterbalance to the intellectualism. And there's nothing wrong with good thinking, profound thinking. We need people who use the brain that God gave them. Keep your elbows to yourself at this point. <laughs> but he says, yeah, that's good. Thinking's good. But you need to know the power of what happened when Christ was crucified amongst you. And he says, that's all I want to talk about. I'm not going to get into your intellectualism. I'm not going to get into your factionalism. You need to know Christ and him crucified. And it's amazing when you think how just one moment, just one day can completely change your life, either for better or for worse. But a single moment in time can alter things forever. And the crucifixion of Christ is one such day. 
And his cross is one such place. And so I want you to come with me on a journey to the cross and realize that our choices not only shape our lives, but the lives of others. The journey to the cross can be considered something symbolic that we enter into with our thoughts, and that's what I'm inviting you to do. But I want to look at somebody who literally took a journey to the cross, and in a moment his life was changed forever and that of his household. In a passage that many of us would consider somewhat boring because it lists a whole lot of names, and we tend to skip over those. Maybe not you, but the person next to you does that. Romans 16, verse 3 to 16, as Paul is concluding his magnificent epistle, he lists 26 people. I love that Paul has people involved in his life. He acknowledges them. He celebrates them. He names them. 26 people. They happen to be 15 men and nine women. Some of them who are named are actually slaves. Some are former slaves. Some were born free. Some even come from royal households. There are Jews and there are Gentiles mentioned in the list. And Paul talks them with this warm endearment as fellow workers, supporters, patrons, people who sponsored and funded his ministry, people who risked their lives for him. He talk, he's in prison at this moment and he talks about some of them as fellow prisoners, companions in prison. There are some apostles that are named. There are people that went before him. And Paul calls them beloved, tested by God and approved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, tested by God, They'd been through some tough times and approved by the Lord Jesus. And there's one name in the journey to the cross that kind of jumps out. It's a single sentence in Romans 16 and verse 13. He says, greet Rufus, whom the Lord picked, whom the Lord picked out to be his very own, whom the Lord chose to be his own. And you kind of think, well, how did that happen? Was there a meeting? Was it at the uh, feeding of the 5,000 and somehow Rufus stuck out, stood out and Jesus said, I picked you and spoke over his life in this public gathering? Now, he was chosen as he journeyed unknowingly towards the cross. You see, Rufus is the son of Simon of Cyrene. And Cyrene is a city in modern day Libya. It wasn't called that then. That as the crow flies is 1,250 kilometers from Jerusalem. And we read in the gospel, I'll reference it in a moment out of Mark's gospel, that Simon took his two sons, Alexander and Rufus, on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to attend the great feast of Passover. Not a flight. They would have been an hour and a quarter if they were allowed to fly. But a journey, a pilgrimage across desert lands, across some mountains, sitting around some campfires, telling stories, listening to stories, perhaps facing some dangers, whether from wild an animals or bandits or who knows. But surely it was not an uneventful journey, walking or even if they were on horseback, traveling 1,250 kilometers on this pilgrimage towards Jerusalem. And Simon arrives with his two boys, probably teenagers, on the Via Della Rosa, the road, the journey that Jesus took to his crucifixion at the exact moment when Jesus passed by, stumbled and fell under the weight of the cross. Let me read it out of Mark's gospel. A passerby named Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the countryside just then. 
and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. And Mark tells us, Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Rufus, the one that Jesus had chosen. And they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. He meets Jesus, God's son, exhausted. I mean, Jesus was exhausted. He'd gone through a succession of trials over a number of nights. He'd been beaten, whipped until his back was torn open. Clearly, he would have lost a lot of blood. And apart from the physical suffering and the blood loss, he falls. God falls. The Son of God falls in sheer exhaustion under the weight of the cross. It's not just the weight in terms of the wood that he's carrying, but he's also carrying the sin of the world, yours and mine. And it's such a heavy burden that he cannot continue. And right at that moment, Simon of Cyrene, with his two sons, Alexander and Rufus, are drawn into the drama, God's history, Jesus' drama. And he's picked out of the multitude and forced to carry Jesus' cross to Golgotha. And so we come with him on this journey as he struggles under the weight of this cross to the place where Jesus is crucified. And it seems ironic to me because clearly Simon becomes a disciple of Jesus. His sons become disciples. They are chosen in this moment of pain, in this moment of suffering, in this moment of despair. And the first thing that he's asked to do is to carry a cross. And if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to remind you that coming to Christ is the forgiveness of sins, the promise of eternal life, the presence of Christ by His Spirit in your life every day. But it's also an invitation to pick up a cross. Jesus calls us as followers to deny ourselves and to follow him. And it would be foolish for us to believe that to do this would be easy. It wasn't easy for Simon to pick up that beam of the cross physically, but Jesus calls us to do a similar thing. Then Jesus told his disciples, Matthew 16, verse 24, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me. Just a little observation. When you first take up a cross, the cross that Jesus invites you to as one of his followers, it'll probably feel like it's killing you. And I don't want to be trite in this, but isn't that what a cross is meant to do? It's the place where you learn to die to yourself to not indulge your own flesh, your own carnality, and live for God's purposes. I love the words of the Apostle Paul in Galatians 2.20. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. I love that. I'm no longer the one living. I'm living by the power of God, for God, for his purpose, for his glory. Not because I have to, not because I'm compelled to, but because I'm drawn by the fact that he loved me and gave himself for me. He loves you and gave himself for you. And I believe that on this Good Friday, there's an invitation for each of us to encounter the cross, to sit as it were at the foot of Jesus' cross, whether it's for the first time or that we haven't been there for a while and it's kind of time to come back. And as you read the gospel accounts, there's so many different responses to the crowd, the multitude around the cross. 
Clearly, they're his followers and Mary, Jesus' mother, standing to the side, weeping uncontrollably and understandably. Mark 15 verse 24 says, they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them. So there's people weeping to the side. There's people literally playing a game of chance at the foot of the cross. And my plea to you is don't play a game of chance at the foot of Jesus' cross. Look up and encounter him. Look up and surrender to him. There are others that just passed by and mocked. And in a sense, 2,000 years later, nothing has changed. Some are playing a game of chance with their life right at the foot of the cross. Some are walking by mocking. But for some, it's salvation. Because when the centurion who was facing him, this man that was probably in charge of the execution of Jesus and the two thieves, the centurion who was facing him saw the way in which he died, breathed his last. He said, truly, this man was the son of God. And there at the foot of the cross, in a moment of encounter, salvation comes to one of the people that was charged with the execution of Jesus. You see, the centurion saw him and responded in awe and surrendered and put his life into the hands of the one who was outstretched on that cross. And I want to urge you to put your life into God's hands in the name of Jesus. Let me try and illustrate. A basketball in my hands is about worth 40 bucks and a lot of embarrassment to me. In the hands of LeBron James, it's worth around 39 million a year. It all depends on whose hands it's in. This is going to be extremely painful. A cricket bat in my hands, if I bought a really good one, they go for about 500 and up from there. But in the hands of Eric Coley, I haven't got over Australia's loss to India yet. It's worth about 28 million a year without sponsorships included. It all depends on whose hands it's in. A golf club in my hand, depending on the day, and whether it's a hook or a slice. This is a good club, actually. It's worth about $120, and not the whole set, just the club. But in the hands, until recently, of Tiger Woods, his career earnings, $1.6 billion. Whose kids are going to go and play golf now? It all depends on whose hands it's in. A stick in my hands could become a nice walking stick as Linda and I go for a stroll, not because I'm aged or decrepit. Do not go there. But in the hands of Moses, it parts the Red Sea because it's God's rod in his hands. It all depends on whose hands it's in. A sling in my hands is an extremely dangerous toy liable to break windows. But in the hands of King David, Goliath falls. It all depends on whose hands it's in. A nail in my hands. I may be able to fix a fence, but in the hell in the hands of Jesus saves the world. A nail in the hands of Jesus saves you and saves me. It all depends on whose hands it's in. And I urge you to put your life into the hands of Jesus. 
In the book of Colossians chapter 2, the apostle Paul says, God made you alive in Christ. When you put your hands into him's hands, he makes you alive. He forgives all your sin. He canceled the record of charges against us and nailed it to the cross, removing our sin. Your destiny, my destiny, is determined by God. Your future is certain if you put your life into His hands. It's not that you won't go through struggle. It's not that you won't experience loss. It's not that you won't go through pain. But you're in the hands of God. Whether you get there or not is up to you. Miles Monroe said that. And that's why I urge you this morning, whether for the first time, renewing a commitment, or as somebody who's traveled with Jesus, a follower for quite a while, to just come back to the foot of the cross. Don't be a mocker. Don't play a game of chance at the foot of the cross. Look up at the one who laid down his life for you and say, truly, this is the Son of God. And in that moment, salvation, deliverance, forgiveness, healing is available to you. For if you publicly declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will experience salvation.